Good morning to everybody. <laughs> this is uh, almost incredible that uh, first morning session is not late as it used to be. So we are just less than almost 10 minutes late, which is one of the first miracles uh, that we are making today. Uh, I want to welcome all of you being here. Uh, my name is Latko Lagumji, as it says in here. Uh, I'm a member of the board of Nizami Ganjavi, locally known as good friend of uh, Ismail and Amr Musa. So everyone who wants to refer to who I am, just you can refer to any one of them and they'll I'll tell you sometimes nice things about them. So um, we are very uh, pleased to have this session, which we agreed some months ago, we talked about with uh, our distinguished keynote speaker, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of World Health Organization, when we were visiting him and his team in headquarters in Geneva some months ago, uh, we started discussing about our future cooperation. And it started like one of those meetings that you have as a, someone who is coming from international organization like us, uh, with the distinguished Director General and our dear friend Tedros, who was running actually at that moment the most the toughest job in the planet. Uh, he was in charge of the health in one of the, at least in my time, lifetime, the most challenging part of our health issues being on the top of any agenda. And then we discussed about Global Buckle Forum, and here we are, Tedros, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we as NGIC signed just recently a memorandum of understanding as NGIC with uh, CP was there, very active in it, and I'm very glad to see her in the first row uh, because she was one of the masterminds behind our uh, energy uh, to do put this in place. So memorandum of understanding of uh, NGIC and the World Health Organization for us is very important, and I'm sure that we will uh, share some thoughts with you about the next steps we want to do. But since Tedros, you were without being uh, really needed to do any more introduction, I'll just say Tedros. Maybe I will start with uh, something that happened. Uh, Secretary, former Secretary General Kofi Annan said once, they said he doesn't need any introduction. Then he said, he should introduce me properly and I will tell you why. Because he was visiting, I think, uh, a place and kids came running to him, calling him Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and then <laughs> Kofi Annan received their papers, they asked him to sign, he signed Morgan Freeman, not to disappoint them. <laughs> so the kids were not disappointed, but then it was a lesson for him to always insist, please introduce me. <laughs> um, the thank you, thank you moderator, excellencies, honorable NGIC members, dear colleagues and friends. Good morning. As I said yesterday, although reported cases and deaths from COVID-19 have been fallen more than 90% from their peaks earlier this year, the COVID-19 pandemic is still far from over. Of course, there is good progress. The transmission is increasing in many countries. Testing and sequencing are decreasing and one billion remain unvaccinated, mostly in low-income countries. So, although it's important to talk about preparing for and preventing future pandemics, we must remain focused on ending this one. That means continuing to vaccinate as many people as possible with a focus on the most at-risk groups, health workers, people over 60 years, and others with conditions that put them at risk of severe disease and death. Nevertheless, 
even as we continue to respond to this pandemic, we must learn the lessons it's teaching us. The time to act is now. The recent history of epidemics and pandemics is a history of panic and neglect. The world reacts with alarm and urgency to a crisis. Then when it subsides, attention is diverted. Lessons go unlearned. And little is done to prevent the next health emergency. That's the real symptom of panic and neglect that we all have observed. As you know, there have been multiple independent reviews of the COVID-19 pandemic with more than 300 recommendations on how to make the world safer. WHO has studied these reviews carefully and synthesized the recommendations into a proposal for a stronger global architecture for health emergency preparedness and response. One of the key recommendations of the reviews was for a new legally binding international instrument to support closer cooperation and coordination between countries in the face of global threats. Some call it treaty, others call it accord, others call it regulation or agreement. The international health regulations provide a vital legal framework for responding to the global spread of disease. But the pandemic has exposed shortcomings in the implementation of the IHR that I believe are best addressed with a convention, agreement, or other international instrument. We have treaties and other international instruments against tobacco, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, climate change, and many other threats to our shared security and well-being. If the nations of the world can come together to agree a common approach to this human-made threat, then it's common sense for countries to now agree on a common approach with common rules for a common response to threats arising from our relationship with nature, threats no human can entirely control or no country can entirely control alone. An intergovernmental negotiating body has now been established and begun its work on developing this new instrument or treaty. Underneath the umbrella of a new international accord or treaty, our proposal includes 10 key recommendations for stronger governance, stronger systems and tools, stronger financing, and a stronger WHO at the center of the global health architecture. First, we need stronger governance that's coherent, inclusive, accountable. Instead of a coherent and cohesive global response, the pandemic has been marked by a chaotic patchwork of responses, which in some cases have punished countries for doing the right thing. As in the case of travel bans imposed on South Africa and Botswana when they first reported the emergence of the Omicron variant. They were punished for doing the right thing. That's why I said lack of coordination hurt countries or lack of obligation and treaty. High level threats need high level political engagement, which is why WHO supports the idea of a head of state council to provide high level political leadership for a rapid and coordinated action. In our view, such a council must be anchored in the constitutional mandate of WHO to ensure political, strategic, and technical coherence. Second, we need stronger systems and tools to prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to health emergencies. Already, WHO has taken steps to build some of these systems and tools, including the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence to enhance the global surveillance through collaborative intelligence. 
We are also piloting the WHO Biohub system, a new mechanism for countries to share novel biological materials. And several countries are now piloting the Universal Health and Preparedness Review, a new peer review mechanism for enhancing national preparedness, something similar to the human rights uh, peer review mechanism. And third, we need adequate and efficient financing domestically and internationally. WHO and the World Bank estimate that 31 billion US dollars is needed every year for strengthening global health security. Two thirds of that could come from existing resources, but that leaves a gap of 10 billion US dollars per year. To close that gap, WHO supports the establishment of a financial intermediary fund at the World Bank to provide a catalytic and gap feeling uh, funding. As G20 leaders have proposed, WHO would play a central role in running the fund by leading its technical work to direct investments in global health security and boost country capacities to implement the international health regulations. A joint finance and health ministers committee would provide oversight and coordination for national and international preparedness financing, including for the intermediary fund. Underpinning all of these proposals, it's clear that the world needs a stronger, empowered, and sustainably financed WHO at the center of the global health security architecture. As you may be aware, the World Health Assembly last month passed a landmark resolution to increase assess contributions to a target of 50% of our budget by the end of the decade, from just 16% now. This was truly a historic decision by the member states, which will surely strengthen WHO. This shift to better quality funding will have major benefits to WHO's ability to deliver long-term programming in countries by attracting and retaining top global health experts to deliver that programming in a sustained way. A new international accord supported by stronger governance, a stronger systems and tools, stronger financing, and a stronger WHO. This is our vision for a world that's better prepared for and better able to respond to health emergencies. At the same time, our efforts to strengthen global health security cannot be divorced from our efforts to strengthen health systems and to support countries on their journey toward this universal health coverage. Strong and resilient health systems are an essential first line of defense against outbreaks. In particular, WHO is urging all countries to reorient their health systems towards primary health care, which is the eyes and ears of every health system, helping to detect and respond to outbreaks at their earliest stages at the community level. Primary health care is also vital for promoting health and preventing disease. Secondary and tertiary care are vital too, but a strong primary health care system can help to prevent or delay the need for secondary or tertiary care, leading to better health outcomes for people and lower costs for health systems, which is a good value proposition. Underpinning all of this must be the conviction that health is not a luxury for the rich, but a human right for all, an end in itself, plus a means to development, not a cost, but an investment. Not simply an outcome of development, but the foundation of social, economic stability and security. And from what we have seen during this pandemic, I hope the world has realized, realized the centrality of health.
Thank you so much. Thank you, moderator. Back to you. After such inspiring speech of uh, Denzel Washington, I would like to uh, to call uh, our team over there to give us a short video of uh, the guy who inherited Morgan Friedman, uh, which is uh, Ban Ki Moon, right? Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, Mr. Robshan Muradov, Secretary General of the Nizami Kanzavi International Center, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my warm congratulations on the occasion of the ninth Global Baku Forum. My special congratulations also go to Dr. Gebrezos on his re-election as a Director General of the WHO. And it is my privilege to deliver this message as part of the 2022 edition of the, this impressive and well-timed forum. Indeed, we stand at an important juncture for humanity, our planet, and the role of multilateralism in helping to forge a more healthy, sustainable, and peaceful future. I take this opportunity to show my sincere appreciation to the Nizami Ganzavi International Center for extending an invitation for me uh, to address this forum. It is playing a pivotal role in promoting the principles of international law, joint societies, tolerance, dialogue, and more. And since 2013, the Baku Forum has served as a robust platform for such dialogue alongside idea exchange, partnership, collaboration, and thought leadership. It was evolved into one of the most forward-thinking international forums by bringing together high-level representatives, heads of state, policymakers, diplomats, and other global leaders to discuss the most important issues of the day and forge new path forward. And this is why I feel that the theme of the ninth global Baku Forum, Challenges to the Global World Order, is a quite timely considering the pressing challenges we face. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, at a time when it seems like our world is becoming ever more fractured, when pandemics and conflicts are growing alongside elevated risks to our planet and its biodiversity. It is critical that we continue to cooperate, innovate, and collaborate across borders and seas. This is how we will persevere over global health threats, build peace and resolve conflicts, mitigate and adapt to climate change, and ensure sustainable development. One tangible way in which we can consolidate the global order is to establish new rules for strengthening the WHO's role in coordination and guidance at the international level. COVID-19 has shown that while multilateral cooperation on public health is urgently needed, the WHO's supranational institutional power remains quite weak. However, transnational disease such as the current COVID-19 pandemic requires a stronger global response through a more binding and responsive multilateralism. In addition to increased resources, new rules to bolster the WHO's technical cooperation with the national authorities are needed, particularly in the face of nationalist pressures, lack of transparency, and inward-looking policies. 
such a change in the present WHO governance is possible, provided that member states agree to it. Following the 2005 SARS pandemic, we implemented the incremental reform, which included an emergency committee with the capacity to declare the existence of a public emergency with international dimensions alongside a new norm that binds national authorities to a compulsory declaration of a list of diseases. These rules must be strengthened. Furthermore, enhancing the logistics and policy coordination at the WHO regional office level should also be a priority. This would provide more room to emerging regions, notably in Africa, in order to better help fragile states in particular. At the same time, in the direct response to the pandemic, rapid universal access to quality assured vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics must be ensured in all countries. And need must be prioritized of the ability to pay in line with the 2030 Agenda pledges of both leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest behind the first. The ongoing COVID-19 crisis only strengthens existing calls for a new multilateralism in which global rules are better calibrated towards the overarching goals of social and economic stability, peace and shared prosperity, while simultaneously going further in recognizing and addressing chronic risks. At the national level, the COVID-19 crisis offers a unique opportunity to set the terms of the public, private, and third sector interaction, ensuring that the transformational blueprint of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs can synergize innovative approaches to policy and partnerships. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with this in mind, I humbly call on you, the eminent and ninth Global Baku Forum participants, to scale up your cooperative efforts to help forge tangible progress on fortifying global health and the United Nations development goals. I strongly believe that in this era of increased uncertainty and division, persevering over COVID-19 and achieving the UN SDGs are two critical efforts that can bring us together at a time when the pandemic elucidates just how interconnected all of us are. Your role is extremely important as we need to ensure that the UN Global Goals are local business and in Baku and beyond. With your elevated efforts, I am confident that we can construct a more healthy, sustainable, peaceful and prosperous world for all. I once again extend my congratulations on the occasion of the ninth Global Baku Forum. I wish this forum a great success. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mission Control, do we have uh, Jeffrey Sachs? Apollo, Apollo, here is Mission Control. <laughs> Jeffrey, how are you? I'm uh, good, you are, how are you? Excellent, I mean, you are the one who was actually a uh, special representative, special project leader from uh, Ban Ki-moon, or we heard now who he was, basically speaking, to Ban Ki-moon and today Antonio Guterres, as someone who is now in intellectual capacity leading the Sustainable Development Goals. And we are already some mentioning, Ban Ki-moon just mentioned some of the things. Uh, Tedros also 
was mentioning SDG, especially SDG 17, which is in the core of the World Health Summit that is going to be in October in Berlin, organized by World Health Organization. So, of course, whatever I ask you, I know you're going to say whatever you thought before. So, but I would just give you a few guidelines to do also answer the questions that we will be interested in. So, please, Jeffrey, could you take a floor? I hope you're in Thank New you. York, right? You are in New York. In in it in Italy today, actually. In, so in greetings Italy. from Siena. Oh. Yes. Oh well, I, I already felt guilty that you are now two <laughs> thirty waking up and waiting for your lineup here. And but now since you're in Italy, no, no. I don't I don't feel so 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 bad. Please. There, it's a very nice morning here and good afternoon to all the friends. Slodko, thank you very much. Uh, Tedros, thank you for your great leadership and and wise words. And thank you to uh, the Nizami Ganjavi forum uh, to uh, invite me to this uh, very important Baku forum. I'm, I'm most grateful. Well, uh, as Tedros has told us, uh, we have not done a good job as a humanity in fighting this pandemic. The uh, official recorded toll is 7 million dead. The uh, mathematical best estimates given the under-reporting of deaths, is around 17 million. This has been a, a, a full debacle. Uh, just extraordinary failures uh, at uh, so many levels, but mostly political. Uh, failures of global cooperation among governments, failures of uh, financing, uh, and also incredible failures uh, within countries. Uh, politicians were not up to this task. They did not understand uh, how epidemics spread, the risks, the kinds of measures uh, that need to be taken. The United States, which does not have a financing problem, uh, had more than one million deaths because uh, there was so little uh, coherence of our national response, so little trust between uh, government and the public, and also the public uh, was incredibly badly behaved. Uh, face masks became highly political, highly charged. The people demonstrating, rioting against wearing face masks, it's a shame because it reflects a complete lack of social responsibility and even awareness of social responsibility. And people died massively because of this kind of uh, uh, failure at the individual level. So I'd say our values were not good. Our politics was not good. Uh, our institutions were weak. Tedros fought and fights very hard to be heard but uh, we're not listening. There's one region that did uh, a relatively good job on this, uh, and that is the, uh, the East Asia and Western Pacific region. Uh, even though China has gotten attacked a lot oh, for its zero COVID policy, the fact is China kept deaths down to very, very low levels. And so did uh, most of the East Asia Pacific region. Because people wore face masks, they listened to government, the government was consequent, there was mass testing, and there was the idea that there is a social responsibility to control a pandemic, whereas in the West, especially in my country, there's a libertarian idea, just leave me alone, don't tell me what to do. And so we have no social cohesion to fight a pandemic like this. But I want to raise two, two other questions, uh, both uh, quite delicate questions, but I think we need to discuss them. And I, it, as a chair of the Lancet Commission, I spent uh, two intensive years. I see many commissioners in the room, and also Nizami Ganjabi was a, uh, was a, a very wonderful supporter of the work of the commission. I, I want to raise two topics. First, uh, the question of the origin of this virus. Because uh, while at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, I believed 
the uh, main narrative that this probably was a natural occurrence. By the end of this pandemic, uh, I'm of the view that uh, this very likely could have come out of U.S. biotechnology uh, and that this could have been a creation from a laboratory. This is not a, a casual statement. I've spent hundreds of hours now on this issue. What I find is complete duplicity by the United States in an honest accounting of the kind of bio uh, research that is underway. But what we know without question is that the United States developed the biotechnology and the intention to experiment in a way that could have created this virus. And that is alarming. Even one of the research proposals uh, that was released only by a Freedom of Information Act explained explicitly the intention to insert a furin cleavage site that is uh, four amino acids, which largely define the infectivity of this virus into uh, unreported strains of SARS-like viruses. That experiment was intentionally to be done. We don't know whether it was done or not because there has not been an honest accounting of what actually was done. But in looking at this and speaking now to dozens of scientists around the world, I can tell you categorically that the United States has not been transparent on this issue. China also needs to be more transparent, but there's a lot of information in the U.S. because the underlying technology that could have created this virus is U.S. technology. And that is something that absolutely needs to be looked at. But it raises the broader question of surveillance in general. The issue of surveillance is not only having monitors uh, to report outbreaks. It is the incredible secrecy that is pervasive about uh, work uh, on biological uh, pathogens uh, around the world right now. There is a lot of hidden research. There's a lot of bioweaponry and biodefense research that we don't know about. There, the capacity of scientists to do extraordinarily dangerous things is real. The gain-of-function research is real. The creation of new viruses is real. None of this is monitored. WHO can't look under the lid. This is the U.S. government and other governments doing this. Unaccountable and to this day, basically unreported. That, unfortunately, is my conclusion after two years of intensive work on this. And honestly, I changed my view because I learned a lot during this process. And I had people lying to me, not telling me the truth. And I saw the ability of governments to hide the facts. So I just want to say this because there are a lot of important people in the room and this is not some wild idea. This is something to this day we don't know because we are not getting transparency from powerful sources. I want NIH to come forward and tell us what the experiments are that have been done and we don't know to this moment. The second thing that I want to raise is the finance question. Uh, I'm proud that uh, I go back a long way with Tedros talking about finance back to uh, the early 2000s. And I've looked at the finance question on public health for a long time. Please, let's not make the same mistake again and again. The World Bank says there's a $10 billion gap. That is absurd. The gap is tens of billions of dollars. But what the World Bank is reporting maybe is the tiniest estimate for something very specific on pandemic preparedness. But the real gap 
is the health systems of poor countries. That's not a 10 billion gap. That's a 50 billion gap. Maybe a 100 billion gap. The poor countries don't have health systems. They can't afford them. And the World Bank has been in the business as long as I've been in this business, which is 40 years, of naming numbers that are too low. And please, let's not do this again. Because that's how I came into public health 21 years ago, as a commission for macroeconomics and health for the WHO. And I was fighting against the World Bank then, because the World Bank had minimized the amounts that needed to be done. And I said, we needed much more money. There was an AIDS pandemic going on. And Kofi Annan uh, brilliantly led the creation of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which I helped to design. But the idea there was we need real funding. And so what I would really strongly recommend is that we don't go with this number of 31 billion with a 10 billion gap. It's nothing like that. It's much, much more. And what I would really strongly recommend is not putting it at the World Bank, frankly, but making a global health fund in Geneva that would combine Gavi and the global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, and make it substantial so that it can fund health systems, that it can really cover the gap in countries that need it. I was just in Kinshasa a couple of weeks ago. The health budget is $3 per capita in a country of 100 million people. So we need real numbers. Honestly, in 41 years, I've never gotten them from the World Bank because the game is to downplay what is really needed. So these are two points that I'd like to make. They're not simple. Uh, there's a lot of uh, geopolitical uh, influence on all of these issues, but we need proper control of the science that is very dangerous right now. We need a proper accounting of what actually happened. Maybe it was natural, but maybe it came out of a laboratory with the US biotechnology playing a lead role. And we need a proper, honest accounting of finances that are needed because our world is falling apart, more and more divided between the haves and the have-nots, and we shouldn't underestimate the needs of those who don't have because they're suffering terribly. But let me conclude uh, by once again where I started. I've watched Tedros in action for 20 years. You do a wonderful job, Tedros, in an extraordinarily difficult circumstance, and we're all grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeffrey. You wouldn't be the astronaut uh, like you are if you wouldn't be surprising us every time with the new ideas. And the ones who want to get the reference, there is article that Jeffrey was, I'm sure, mentioned, thinking about that he, together with his colleague, Neil Harrison, published just a little bit less than a month ago in uh, uh, National Academy for Science publication, which, of course, National Science of, uh, National Academy Association uh, said that on the end of every uh, article like that, this is not our opinion, this is opinion of the authors. So, which means that Jeffrey is really also always pointing the new questions in a very uh, interesting way. Uh, of course, uh, Maria, Maria Espinoza, dear friend, uh, 73rd President of the UN General Assembly, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, um, I'm sure that, Maria, now it's, you would give us your perspective on the things that I've already mentioned, so I won't go in details of what we agreed upon that I'm going to ask you, because the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Sladko. And, uh, you know, this position of speaking after Dr. Tedros and Jeffrey Sachs, what am I going to say? <laughs> I kept thinking about that. And, and perhaps... You know, what is, you said something, uh, Dr. Tedros, 
we we are not learning the lessons uh, we are as humans we are unable you know to learn from experience we had ebola and other pandemics and yet we continue to make the same mistakes i, I think that uh in 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 you said dr tedros uh, we have gone through many you know, independent commission studying what happened with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have more than 300 recommendations, 300 recommendations. So I have the impression that we know what to do. The question I have is how we are going to do it and who is going to do it. And the simple answer is that it is a whole of society response to this. I know WHO has to be, uh, I see sometimes in pandemic situations, WHO has been a sort, a sort of planetary universal CDC or something uh, uh, like that. But what we have learned, we have learned that we are vulnerable and that we are in the interdependent. And regardless of how big a country is, uh, how, you know, the GDP or the square kilometers of the population, we need each other. The goit alone responses do not work. The number two that we have learned, it, it was already said that pandemics, preparedness, resilience building, is very much dependent in how robust and strong our health systems are. And there, uh, I have a little soft spot uh, for universal health coverage. That, uh, I think, is the key for resilience building and the response capacity. Uh, the number three is the humans, the society. And we hear over and over again that we lacked social cohesion. Uh, we acted in a selfish way both as societies but also as leaders and, and i think that what we learn also is the importance of civil society the importance of the private sector coming together uh, with with uh, the public sector we also learn the importance of the subsidiarity principle in healthcare and health systems and the important role of local governments uh, what municipalities uh, are able to do. That was, I think, transformative. We also learned that vaccines are important. And I think that that was one of the positive, uh, of the positive lessons learned of this pandemic. Scientific cooperation and the record in developing a vaccine. So the vaccine is, the, is, is very important, of course, but perhaps more important is the deployment capacity and the health architecture to make it happen in a way. Access to vaccines what was our first pain and we saw how humanity acted in a very uh, a selfish way. Uh, um, health for all, vaccines for all, that, that's, it wasn't a rule that worked uh, during this pandemic that is not over yet, as, as Tedros uh, just mentioned. So vaccines important, but not enough strong health systems, health infrastructure, as deployment capacities uh, are extremely important. And, um, and another issue that we learn is, the shorthand for that is women and girls. In most countries, more than 70% of the health care workers are women. In some countries, even up to 90% of the health uh, um, workforce are women. And yet, if we count how many women were in positions of power or in this decision-making positions during the pandemic response process, we go down to 20 or even less. I know that you have the numbers, uh, Dr. Tedros, but that was shocking. You know, women were doing the unpaid, uh, underpaid work, um, were subject to harassment in work, uh, a huge pay gap between men and women in health. Uh, so this is something that we really need to learn and, and, and fix. And we are capable of providing women with a safe and fair working environment. And speaking about women, the shadow pandemic of, of COVID, we also learned that uh, staggering numbers of, of uh, gender-based violence because of lockdowns and other situations created by the pandemic. So 
in responses uh, to health emergencies, uh, the gender equality lens and the women's rights lens does count and it is important. Um, Jeffrey Sachs said, uh, we weren't wise as humanity, as leaders. Uh, we weren't generous enough, we didn't cooperate enough, uh, we didn't have a, a, a strong multilateral um, um, a consensus building mechanisms to face the pandemic. And it is true, but we saw also good practices, not only from the scientific community that got together to develop the vaccine, but we saw an impressive response capacity of regional cooperation. Uh, I was positively impressed of the, of the African Union coming together for a collective procurement mechanisms uh, to develop uh, regional best practices and shared among uh, the countries in Africa. Uh, we saw the ASEAN countries also acting together strong as a region. My own region, unfortunately, came too late, but at the end of the day, we came out uh, with, uh, with um, uh, a self-reliance health cooperation platform uh, under ECLAC and, and CELAC. We came late and unfortunately and painfully, uh, I think Latin America was for a long time like the epicenter in terms of, of deaths and, and, and transmission uh, because our health systems are weak, because our cooperation and, and regional integration was also suffering before uh, the COVID pandemic. So uh, you, I think that we have a decalogue of, of teachings of this pandemic. The important uh, of, of this is how we prepare better, and not only from the institutional perspective, and I, and I think that Dr. Tedros was very exhaustive to, to say this is what we need to do. Jeff said, let's put the numbers right. We need to fund not only pandemic preparedness, but our entire health systems, especially for the poorest countries. That's, that's a strong lesson, but perhaps uh, I, I think it's important that uh, we learn that multilateralism is the most important tool and instrument. Uh, to strengthen the power of WHO, it's extremely important. I, I really uh, am I'm looking forward to seeing uh, flourish uh, the pandemic treaty, Dr. Tedros. But the pandemic treaty together with the review process of the international health regulations. And uh, I really hope that uh, sometimes uh, uh, go it alone, selfish responses do not allow the pandemic negotiation to go as fast as we need the pandemic to go, the, the, the treaty uh, to go. And a treaty on pandemics has a heart and the beating heart of a pandemic treaty is strong health systems and universal health coverage. So um, it, there is uh, uh, perhaps much more that we can do. It's as, as again, as I said, I would like to join others to, to thank and, uh, Dr. Tedros for his effort, leadership, uh, visionary leadership in, in really very, very difficult times. Um, we cannot say that the pandemic is over and perhaps just to close um, a, a very general comment about uh, COVID recovery uh, plans and, and efforts being done around the world. And uh, we kept saying building back better, building back forward, not making the same mistakes of the past. And unfortunately, we are seeing a very uneven recovery of, of, uh, from the COVID pandemic. We are seeing uh, in, in the wealthy countries billions and trillions invested in recovering the economy, leaving behind, again, the countries of the global south, the poorer countries. And I think that if we are thinking about a recovery that builds the world in a different way, we need to think uh, in a generous way that uh, no one can be left behind. And, and we have a little engine that we agreed already and that needs to be funded. And we need trillions of, of dollars to fund the implementation of the sustainable development goals. Not only the goal on health, but all the, the sustainable development goals, especially the ones on inequalities, which is uh, the 
most profound uh, structural problem that we're facing, poverty, exclusion, uh, and access uh, to public goods. I, I would leave it there and, uh, and back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we had uh, four speakers, and uh, one word that uh, Valdes was uh, repeated again and again was multilateralism. And since you are the star among us, uh, when we talk about multilateralism, uh, I would like to have your reflections on that, especially having in mind that in light of our memorandum of understanding of NGIC with World Health Organization, uh, what we want to do is we want somehow to advocate, uh, let's say, the overall uh, goals of World Health Organization, but our, our goals as well, which is about inclusive, equitable, and accountable uh, healthcare system for all, not only vaccines, vaccine is the first step, concrete, but then open the process of uh, strengthening the not only the World Health Organization, but the mission that your World Health Organization is having because uh, uh, of the fact that if you have, uh, as we spoke yesterday intensively, multilateral system is generally speaking jeopardized in an almost dead end street. And maybe uh, the, World Health, the, the World Health Organization is unique on multilateral level that people are not only putting together themselves because of the values, but also because of interests. So uh, more countries you want to put together about the values, it's okay. But when you put them around the interests, the number of is scaling down. With health care system, with World Health Organization mission, the interests are also a big portion of common interests. So maybe the health care system and health in general is a good example, should be a good example of multilateral efficiency uh, because uh, the values and interests are enormously high among all stakeholders. So that may be our interest to do, start maybe with this. So I'm not, uh, so I won't push you more on this area. I know you're going to say something anyway, but I would like to have your, your thoughts about this, how we can strengthen the health as a global issue in more organized and beneficiary way for all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You gave me a task I could talk for about six, seven hours. So I will try to be much more practical. At first, uh, I would like to say that I'm a person who has spent a part of my life being a, a physician, that means treating people, you know, and meeting people who, who are in need. Uh, and uh, part of my life, I have been a politician. Uh, so I will start uh, with that point that health organization is a very important uh, issue. When I was asked in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, do we really need World Health Organization? And maybe, you know, it's uh, just a waste of money, you know, I was really surprised, you know, but my answer was very clear. We absolutely need it because it's like, uh, for everybody to understand, it's a global ministry of public health uh, with all these tasks. Uh, and uh, I would say the structure of this organization is, is adequate to, to fulfill these tasks which people expect. Um, where is the problem, you know? Uh, the problem is that uh, the health uh, World Health Organization uh, recruits its employees, you know, they are experts. They recruit experts to do the job. But the organization uh, is based on membership states. And the membership states are represented by, by politicians. Uh, and therefore, in the beginning, you know, uh, they decide what to do, what tasks to, to, to give World Health Organization, and sometimes they know, and sometimes they don't know. They just want to be, you know, very effective ones. So they are the same as, as the founding fathers of the World Health Organization, but from the other point, uh, they are the customers of uh, World Health Organization because uh, every country and every region is in need and World Health Organization is uh, uh, giving them assistance on healthcare uh, problems. This system works very well, but uh, as we saw uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, um, the politicians were so confused, they very often didn't listen to the recommendations of World Health Organization. And sometimes even like in the case of President Trump, they just said, oh, we don't need that. 
No, they are stupid. They don't know uh, what to say, and they they, they are false, and, and so. So this is a perception from politicians. Why it is so? Uh, because uh, politicians are not experts, and not only on medical care. They follow the demand of people, you know. But uh, who forms the demand of people, you know, uh, is a question of, of hundred billion dollars. Uh, so. We need to improve this interface, this, uh, let's say, cooperation between experts and, uh, and, and, and politicians who make the decisions. Uh, because, let's say, the World Health Organization is pretty fast. The structure with the regional offices and representatives in definite countries, you know, they collect the information when they are monitoring, you know, and give to the, the central part of the World Health Organization. And the response is really quick. And it was really quick even in this pandemic. But uh, let's say the they, let's say implementation of these recommendations, which are done by, by politicians, was delayed or even opposed. So, because I want to uh, to tell you that the vaccination, uh, okay, it's created by medical people, by research people, you know, but basically it's implemented how to vaccinate, whom to vaccinate, yeah, in which order, you know. Uh, with which vaccine and so on, you know, it's uh, up to politicians. They made political decisions. So the single act of vaccination is a medical and done by medical people, you know, but the vaccination of the society is a social political issue. And we have to understand that, and that these politicians and experts must work together. Uh, it's very important to, to also to, to talk to the population. We, we may have the best ever, you know, structures and organizations with the smartest people in the world. If you don't deliver the message to the, to the ground level, to those who need this assistance, who need this help, uh, then we are going to fail. We are going to talk, but uh, these people are not going to gain some benefits from that. Uh, one just uh, example. We have forgotten about the, the, the anti-vaxxer movements, and the anti-vaxxer movements were very strong in the developed states. And we have to think why it happened. Because one of the arguments was, you know, the vaccine is not t uh, tested. We are making experiments on us. So why it happened? Uh, we have to understand ourselves and then explain the, the, the people. At first, you know, we were shocked by the uh, beginning of pandemic, you know. We got something we don't know. We got uncertain uh, future. Uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, we got a lot of casualties. We got uh, overloaded hospitals. We got, you know, uh, a fear about what's going on. And, and, uh, and the first was, actually, was very simple. Lockdowns, you know. Uh, Masks, which was the easiest way to so. But everybody understood that vaccines are of great importance because we cannot uh, tackle this this crisis of, of pandemic uh, without vaccines. No, there was a great demand, and I talked to some researchers who worked on the, the vaccines, and I said, in the first time in my life, experienced surgeon said, experienced science scientist said, uh, I've got money unlimited. So the big pharma companies you know, understood the global demand for vaccines and they offered all the money and they started the competitions. Therefore, the researchers who had already developed, uh, let's say, the basis for, for creating these vaccines, uh, they accumulated this money very quickly because the demand was when, 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 we need vaccines, when. Uh, and uh, let's say, that changed the world, you know, and uh, the next step was, you know, signing contracts uh, uh, for deliveries uh, with unregistered vaccines, you know, so we are trying to jump in in the process, not to be late, you know, to protect uh, our own populations, you know, vaccine nationalism, and, and everything was happening there. A big mess, you know, and nobody was happy, you know, but it created the ground, you know, for people who said, you know, they are not tested. I'm afraid to use it. I, I, will, I will wait and see. So, and uh, we said, we don't know how time, this is stupid population, you know, the, and we blame them that they are not uh, educated anymore, that they are not socially responsible, but basically, you know, 
we didn't deliver them the message why the process is going on like that. And uh, today we have forgotten. We have forgotten this because, oh, the COVID is over. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID may come back. That's one option. And uh, we can face another pandemic with another virus, you know. So we have to be prepared, but we have not finished this and, oh, it's over. But we have talked to the, uh, our populations and explained how were the decisions, which were the right decisions, which are the wrong decisions, because it, otherwise they will not be prepared for the next uh, pandemic we will face. And we will face. At the end, some, uh, some uh, points on what, what Jeffrey said. Uh, uh, I will not be popular by saying I don't care where the virus come from. Because, you know, when it has started its life uh, in human population, it became a part of nature. Coming from nature or coming from a lab is not any more important. And here, the virus developments were according to the rules of nature. And uh, we were afraid of Delta, but uh, we didn't expect that the Omicron this will destroy Everything we, we, we have created in a year with hard work, you know, certificates, tests, whatever, you know, Omicron just uh, killed Delta and uh, we are on, on a safe side, more or less safe side today. So uh, that's one point. Uh, the other point is that zero, zero COVID policy is absolute mistake. Because we ha if it has become a part of the nature, we have to be in cohabitation. Humans and virus be, must be in a cohabitation. And the both, uh, let's say, zero COVID and, uh, let's say, uh, immunity of, 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 of society are the farthest points, uh, the, the right way somewhere in the middle. So we have to, the, goal, the, the, the main goal is to low down the, the death rate and not to overload our medical uh, healthcare systems. This is simple, you know, but uh, it's very difficult to understand. More simple the things. Multilateralism, I agree with you, it's very important, but uh, we have to work on World Health Organization. All said before is absolutely right about the funding. If the World Health Organization, we expect to be, to be a strong organization, only 20% comes from the member state fees. Uh, and 80% come from donations. That means, you know, I like it, I give money, I don't like it, I, I don't give the money. Uh, at the same time, we have to look at uh, let's say solidarity, which was mentioned before. I would, uh, let's say, increase the membership fees according to the, each country's you know, GDP. That means that the, who are richer, they pay more, who are poor, they pay less, because those who are in need are poor countries. And we have to bring up, according to all our plans, at the healthcare level on, 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 on the poor countries. And my last word is very simple. Don't forget about the human rights. Human rights violations go hand in hand with bad healthcare. That's my simple message, and don't forget that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Valdis. Uh, uh, before introducing our next speaker, uh, who is coming from our host country, I want to say that uh, in light of what we just heard, uh, solidarity in this area and equity in this area is one of the crucial principles. I'm coming from the country that was severely, severely jeopardized and hit by pandemic. When it comes to the number which is unquestionable, like deaths per million inhabitants, uh, we are on the top three of the globe as a country. And uh, we really know what solidarity means. Uh, Azerbaijan is the country and President Aliyev personally is the one uh, who came to Bosnia and Herzegovina with the help when we were in need. And it says a lot itself. It says, I mean, forgive me for my, let's say, privilege to use this opportunity to thank the country uh, of Azerbaijan to helping us, and President Levy, who was helping us directly 
with the support of vaccines and medical supplies when we were in real need. Uh, so without further introduction, uh, of course, uh, someone who represents this country in this area the best is uh, Minister of Health, uh, Mr. Timur Musayev. And uh, I was joking to him, if, if time machine exists, I would probably introduce him by saying, Robert De Niro, when he was younger, I mean, is with us. And, uh, and uh, so here we are. Please, Timur, could you take a floor? And thank you so much. Your Excellencies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I think the main message that we shouldn't forget that we are on board just one spaceship called Earth. So the, the question of multilateralism will be launched immediately. Almost three years passed since the moment when World Health Organization declared state of emergency in the field of public health due to outbreak of COVID-19. Now it's time to discuss the lessons derived from management of this pandemic, although we are far from the end. At the same time, the lessons you may already heard today, I will take courage and to be focused on some of them. The first lesson we learned is that the spread of infectious diseases is a global matter because of advanced globalization. Unfortunately, some countries uh, took away to defend the health and to take care health, health of their own citizens at any cost. The second lesson is that intellectual property rights should be waived when the health is a matter of major concern. All member states of the WHO should come to consensus and sign legally binding documents. But at the same time, nevertheless, the proper financial support and awards should be bestowed for scientists. Third lesson is that citizens to government trust is a key component for pandemic response and management. Governments Transparency and accountability, ensured public trust in prevention measures and vaccines. Only countries with strong IT infrastructure succeeded to provide high quality education at any level based on distant learning during pandemic. Until now, Education is one of the most vulnerable part of our lives globally. Fifth lesson is the government's maturity is a key factor for agile combat strategies and quick reactions in response with pandemic measures. The experience of the Republic of Azerbaijan was several times acknowledged by high level representatives of many international organizations. For prompt implementation of preventive and urgent measures, by the guidance of the President, His Excellency Mr. Ilham Aliyev, the task force was established under the Cabinet of Ministers. In a short period of time, hospitals bed capacity were increased all the necessary medical equipments and medicines were provided to all the medical facilities. From the first days in our country, all measures were done in strong collaboration with the World Health Organization. Sixth lesson, and I will especially would like to, to attract your attention to this point, one of the core unpredictable social and medical complications are mental health deteriorations that don't recognize ethnic groups, nationalities, and that have the same development dynamic during and after spring of, of pandemics. Due to lockdowns and depression, 
the number of mental issues increased incredibly. Psyche resources were vanished until now humanity hasn't recovered from it and this has incredible impact on perception of other global threats like wars, starvation and climate change. And finally, the seventh lesson learned is that new benchmark for healthcare professionals is already set up. The benchmark based on absolute integration and unification of biomedical sciences and information technologies. Healthcare landscape were dramatically changed due to big data flow. The urgent need for new medical professional staff that would combine perfect clinical and research minds with capability of riding the most advanced technologies of digital world tops the agenda. The World Health Organization has named vaccine hesitancy as one of the major global threats. The Director General stated that we are not just fighting pandemic, we are fighting infodemic. Profit-oriented perception of infodemic brought uncontrolled flow of unproven and sometimes socially dangerous information to all media users and all of us were witnesses of that. The fighting of misinformation is a common task and common responsibility. Media has no rights to broadcast scientifically proven and unproven information at the same basis. And we have to come to certain legal points to sign certain documents to somehow regulate it. Because during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen the flow of this information that basically uh, totally detract, distracted population later on. Uh, from the starting, it was the mask story. Then we come to anti-vax movement. Being a doctor, I would like to explain in a simple example how its influence on human psyche. When we announce the diagnosis to some patients, they pass through four stages. It doesn't matter what kind of disease it is. First, it's shocked. Second, it's neglect. It can be happen with me. Third, it's acceptance, and only force is okay. I am ready to fight. Please help me. And this is right not just for individuals. It's absolutely right for societies, for communities, unfortunately for countries. And we've seen many times when countries behaved immature in this way, especially with pandemic. To address misinformation, government of Azerbaijan has shared accurate, clear, and easy to find information regarding all aspects of COVID-19. Strong public campaigns were carried out through media, civil society, uh, medical and educational facilities. Another lesson learned and uh, this can be, I think, like a global trend, that proper and on-time big data analysis is a key factor for the right decision-making. And for this kind of governmental platforms should be established for on-time and proper data exchange that would lead to each government in each country to have to the right decision in the right time, and at the same time, to be interdependent with other countries around. What we've seen during pandemic, these chaotic decisions basically postpone 
certain proper steps to be done. To resolve this, applying transparent and cyber secure augmented reality and artificial intelligence technologies is the only way to get global coordination of early warning system, transmission tracking, and as well sharing vaccines, medical devices, medicines, tests, etc. There is a strong demand to go beyond the health and to address the socio-economic determinants of the health. It's time to invest, to do the proper investments in healthcare systems that let us to provide strong social background for resilient and sustainable economies to be ready for possible future global threats. The scarcity of resources and uh, some limiting factors like commercial-based uh, vaccine production is another two challenges to be addressed, especially in developing countries. We would like to declare that we see the World Health Organization as the highest authorized international health institute with new approach regarding its financing in the view of global health economy and global pandemic economy. The absence of viable uh, global pandemic policy push many countries to consolidate around certain initiatives like COVAX. We should clearly perceive that COVAX is an initiative that faced with unfair and wild market rules that hardly compel with global humanity demands. Today in Azerbaijan, we celebrate the Healthcare Workers' Day. And me as a Minister of Health, on behalf of all healthcare workers of my country, wish you strong health, bright mind, and collective prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, Minister. Uh, Madine, you are, you have a floor. Madine Ivanich, former president, member of the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you see this lineup in here. That's why we talk so softly and nicely, because four of us have in our CV that we've been ministers of foreign affairs. So we have to speak softly and nicely. And of course, we have a, we have three medical doctors in here in this lineup, and they have to be more concrete at the same time. So Mladene, as, a, as among other heads, as a foreign minister, but as a, a profession being smart, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Like Maria, I also asked myself, what me, like an ordinary poor politician, could say we should look clever after Dr. Tedros about the global health governance. But then I remember the advice from my older colleague when I was first time elected on the political level, that colleague told me there is no issue on which capable politician couldn't find answer. So I will try to be a clever politician to say something clever after all these my colleagues before. Did we really learn the lessons from this pandemic? I remember this message, no one is safe as everyone is safe. And what we really witnessed in reality, millions of the vaccines destroyed in the rich countries and a lack of the vaccines in the poor countries. And this is reality. Another 
story which I believe is there was that at the beginning especially there was a real chaos I remember that competition among the countries who will buy the ventilators 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 <laughs> that was a mess and then the outcome of that approach was basically isolation all the countries were during the pandemic especially at the beginning isolating thinking just on themselves, on their citizens, even don't care about the rest of the world. And we know that the virus is this sort of the thing that it can be spread all over the world. There are no borders. And even with, the, with, with the, all these attempts to close completely the borders, virus was there because you can't completely close everything. So I think that if I add to that even the recent political developments, the main kind is uh, faced with the dilemma, how to react on these threats? Is it selfish approach or do we really need the cooperation? Okay, the logical answer would be cooperation, but is this reality? Unfortunately, I believe it is not, and it will not be even in the future, which is a shame. But we, don't, we cannot accept that reality and say, let's live with that. We have to make as much pressure as we can to increase the real, honest cooperation on the global, global scene, on the globe, generally. And UN role there is essential. It's essential. It cannot be bureaucratic like it was in the last maybe 10, 15 years. It has to be with a more, even if it's risky, and I can imagine how difficult it was to be the Director General of the World Health Organization once you have on one hand the pressure that you are pro-Chinese because you didn't attack them and a few months later the Chinese attacked you that you are not, that you are against them. But we need personalities ready to take a risk and not just to do the routine job in these situations. So we, I think that there is a need to emphasize multilateral institutions. And speaking about the health, definitely we need a stronger uh, World Health Organization, especially taking into account that we can expect similar things in the future. And if, if everything will remain like it is now, so poor uh, healthcare systems in a poor countries, I think that the, the conditions really to have another pandemic is there. So one of the key priorities has to be to increase the healthcare system in a poor countries to emphasize the multilateral institutions dealing with these issues and not to be selfish because there is no sense to be selfish in, in, in this, kind of the, this kind of the world. With the common efforts, with the emphasis on that, I think that we can, we can succeed and to be much better prepared uh, for the potential new threats which we can expect in the future and I'm quite quite sure. Hope that this is the most, maybe for this phase, the most important message and that's the way how I try to be clever enough for the very difficult issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mladenet. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, is, do we have Jeffrey online or he went for cappuccino in Siena? We do? Okay. I am Jeffrey. here, yes. yes. Okay, so you had your cappuccino and you're back. Now, uh, <laughs> would you try to be, we have a, because the people who are, from, are organizing this are killing me and I will be the guilty one, so we are breaking every, every timing. So please, I would like to have just a quick, quick round of uh, some reflections of what we heard from each other, from the panelists. And so, Jeffrey, please. Just, just a word for President Zotler. We need to know where this came from. 
because the U.S. government is still funding dangerous viruses. It's not a matter even of just this one. We have to understand this because how are we going to have surveillance? How are we going to have control unless we understand what's actually happening? And we don't because it's secret. And if you want trust with government, how can it be that when the NIH is asked to report, it gives 290 redacted pages? It doesn't tell us anything. We know because there are leaks, because there are Freedom of Information Act, but then we're supposed to have trust when we don't have any honest accounting of what is going on. So this is not just a matter of this pandemic. This is a matter of ongoing risk in the planet. We must understand where this virus came from. And there's a lot of information that the U.S. government should provide. We need to know it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think that, uh, Valdez, this is just introduction for your final words. Yeah, please. Yes, Jeffrey, I agree with you that, that we have to know, but uh, what I said, I said that uh, when the virus is in the population, uh, it, it doesn't matter for the medical people, you know, and for politicians how to tackle it. I agree with problem. that. Yeah, I, but, agree uh, that. I agree with you, so we are on consensus. We are complementary okay. to each other. Good. That's fine. Thank you. Valdis, do you have your also some final words without just reporting to Jeffrey, I mean, and his very interesting, always interesting comments. So, please. So, I, I, I would say that I, I am very happy to be a part of this panel, you know, uh, because it was a very vivid discussion and uh, uh, looking for the future and uh, really uh, trying to analyze the role of World Health Organization and, and the principle of multilateralism uh, in uh, tackling the future problems we are going to face inevitably. No? So thank you very much for all the panelists and thank you very much uh, Mr. Chairman you know, and thank you very much for Nizam Ganjavi. You know. We are on the right way. Thank you very much to everybody listening. Thank you all this. Uh, Maria? Three words? No. I, no, more, no more words. Please, please don't speak <laughs> only three key words. Oh, no. Uh, Basically, a word on this um, uh, financial intermediary fund, Dr. Tedros. And um, first of all, of course, we need to have the numbers right. And uh, because we're, we're speaking here about a universal funding uh, for strong and resilient health systems. But I, I think the financial mechanisms uh, are important. I don't know how many. Uh, illness specific funds there are, uh, you, you know better, but I have counted around 20 um, uh, health related funds, uh, Gavi, the TB, HIV, AIDS, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a well orchestrated mega global health fund would help. You said that uh, the authority of the fund is going to be under the World Bank. We have had a long discussion at the Lancet Commission about what would be um, the ideal um, like choreography and governance. But the only thing that I can say is we need uh, to inform the management of the fund uh, from a, a scientific and technical perspective. WHO has to have the main say in whatever architecture that we come up with. And the other two uh, uh, words, um, one is about self-interest. I think the multilateral system in general is suffering of uh, countries that speak about uh, national interest first, national sovereignty first. But when we're talking about global threats to human security, I think national interest becomes solidarity, cooperation, and concerted action. That is how we can translate national interest on climate change, on pandemics, uh, on terrorism, and you name it. So multilateralism and multilateral responses have to be in the at the center. And the other two words, one is trust. Uh, we need, and I say we, citizens of the world, leaders of the world, we need to regain 
the trust of citizens in institutions. This is critical, this is really harming the relationship between governments and citizens and, and also eroding, um, um, I would say, uh, er eroding social cohesion and a social contract. And number three uh, is the importance uh, of science, of science well-informed uh, decisions. So uh, I agree, uh, uh, Valdez, with you when you say science and politics have to come together in a harmonious uh, uh, way. And basically we're, what we are in search for is a multilateral system that is values-based. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Well, as always, Maria, thank you so much for encapsulating almost major points that we all uh, have in here, but in front of all of us. So, Madine, let's go in this direction and then I will call uh, uh, Taimur and, of course, then Tedros. We, we end with two, T2, right? With Taimur and uh, Tedros. So, Madine, before 2T or T2, please. Uh, speaking about uh, different multilateral organizations, we can find some of them uh, who are, well, let's say, efficient enough, and some of them which are completely lost in some political discussions among the member states. I think that we can say that a World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, UNICEF, UNESCO are among those who, who are, according to my opinion, efficient enough. Why? Because they have a structure, they have institution, they have a very clear mission and very clear mandate. And they are experts-based organization without too many political influences. So I think that the future of the efficient multilateral institutions is exactly that. Clear mandate, clear structure, and uh, let's say expert-based uh, uh, work. Uh, I think that this, these institutions are really needed and hope that this will be uh, the case in the future and that we can even more support this sort of institutions because we see a lot of, a lot of benefits from uh, these institutions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Musayev, Timur, please. I would like uh, to say that, of course, pandemic is a crisis, but without crisis, humanity hardly have ever done kind of progress. And this crisis also was kind of opportunity for us to make certain steps ahead in science, in humanitarian part of our life and we will never ever be the same anymore. The same time, the perception of idea of health and what does to be, to be mean, to mean was to be healthy is totally changed now. And we can't see each of us separately from our community, from our society, from our countries, from our globe. And I think in closest time, we'll see the changing of medical education, the changing of concepts of new generation of doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers that will be ready for any possible global threats in the future because they will have absolutely different humanitarian mind free from commercial perception of opportunities to treat people, rather than to see, to scavenge their humanitarian mission as a people, first of all, bringing health to everyone's life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. So, Tedros, I think you should Give us few few words, your thoughts, and what we 
what you would like us to take a message from here and people who are with us and who are following us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think I should start from uh, thanking all panel members, including our moderator. Uh, many excellent ideas. And um, I have uh, taken a good note, uh, but I will focus on a couple of issues. Uh, one on the origins of the virus. Um, knowing the origins will help us to prevent the next one. So, because um, without knowing the origins, it will be difficult to prevent the next. So that's science. Uh, but it has the, um, the moral dimension as well. So the reason we have to do the origin study is to prevent the next one. But the reason we have to do the origins is we have also moral obligation. We owe it to those who have died because of this COVID, to their families and those who have suffered because of COVID. Um, Jeff has been saying, he was saying that the number of deaths is not actually as being reported now, 6 million. Based on the WHO estimates, it's more than 15 million. So it's, it's, uh, it's tragic. So any country should be transparent and should give information to really understand what happened in 2019 or before and know exactly where this virus came from and then it can help us to prevent the next one and it can help us also to address the moral issue um, but the cooperation I, um, I think Jeff uh, has said about the US um, with regard to the um, several hypotheses we have, WHO's position is um, since we haven't found any evidence that can convince us whichever way beyond reasonable doubt, we need to keep all options, including the lab leak. And as you know, we have sent a team to China and uh, there is some progress, but at the same time there are challenges. For instance, which I have said many times, that cooperation from China, especially in sharing raw data, is not there. So we need cooperation. Without cooperation, without having raw data shared, without transparency, we cannot find how, you know, the origin of the virus. This is not politics. This is science. And we're asking this as WHO. It's not because anybody asking us to, to say anything. Of course, what Jeff said um, when I asked China to cooperate, they uh, said U U.S. should be investigated as well. U.S. lab should be investigated as well. Then I said, fine, but the first report of COVID came from you. So you cooperate, you show us the lab, then we will go wherever it leads us. Wherever. Could be U.S., could be Europe. It could be anywhere. We will go wherever that leads us. But let's start from where it started, where we got the first report. Then from that report, we can go anywhere. So as Jeff said, all options are open. Without knowing exactly what happened, we cannot say this or that. We keep all options open. So that's where, where we are. And there was a SEGO report, Origins report, last week. And we urged all countries um, to, to help and cooperate and not politicize this process because we should do it for the sake of science and we should do it for the sake of uh, moral. Then the other issue is on um, um, finance. On finance, uh, Jeff, you write, 10 billion is not enough and the focus should be in strengthening the health system, especially in low-income countries. The 10 billion estimate is only for pandemic preparedness and response, so it, it has a very narrow um, focus for additional money for pandemic preparedness and response. 
But as you said, and which is correct, pandemic pre pre preparedness and response needs a strong health system. So investment in the health system itself is very important. So the 10 billion is in addition to what we need to strengthen the health system. It's not the 10 billion which will cover everything. And the focus will actually be in strengthening the health system. And what we are saying to all countries, rich or poor, is we have to invest in primary health care. We have to invest in, in public health. Um, many countries, high-income countries, were surprised by this virus. This virus created crisis in high-income countries who have, who have everything. They don't have uh, problems with resources. The reason for that is they were investing in cutting-edge technology for secondary and tertiary uh, health services, robotic surgery, and so on, but they completely neglected the basics, that's the primary health care or the public health, the surveillance, the contact tracing, um, and they paid for it. But the investment in primary health care or public health, which is needed, is actually very, very, very small. But it has to be done. So the focus should be primary health care, the focus should be pri uh, public health. But of course, we are not saying ignore secondary or tertiary services. There should be there. But all countries, whether it's high income or low income, should, should invest in primary health care and public health. Relatively, those who have done better with this pandemic are especially from the region that um, Jeff said. The specific region is the Mekong region. And these are the Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. They had the first SARS. They have muscle memory. They prepared the system. They invested in primary health care. They invested in public health. And they, be they did better. So I think that's the way forward. And in terms of investment or financing, although there is this fifth for pandemic preparedness, focused um, uh, financing, uh, I think the investment or the financing of the uh, health system and moving toward this universal health coverage with a strong foundation of primary health care will be the most important. So the need, the funding we need is actually more than the 10 billion, I say. The 10 billion is for a specific area. Uh, when you add the rest of the funding, it will be much higher and it will be uh, domestic financing and it, it will be uh, global financing uh, as well. So these are the um, couple of issues uh, I would like to, to raise. Uh, but my colleague, um, Foreign Minister, former, <laughs> we were both former Foreign Ministers, he, just, he mentioned one thing, uh, which is true. As you remember, there was accusations from the former U.S. administration on WHO on a couple of issues and even asking us for something which we couldn't give because it was the wrong thing to do. So we had serious challenges, as you may remember. And because of the, we are pressing the Chinese government also on the origin study to cooperate. And from both sides, what we got is exactly the same. The U.S. believes that we are in China's pocket. And the Chinese said, attack that saying, we are in U.S. pocket. Of course, we are in a pocket, but we are in the principal's pocket. And we do our job in, in, in good faith. And if you follow principles, you cannot satisfy everybody. Sometimes, because as long as countries are concerned, always they see it from their own interest. Of course, it's not wrong to see it from their own interest. And I cannot say you, you should not see it from your own interest or national interest. But what we advise them is, please have the national interest. So not only the, nas the enlightened national interest, enlightened national interest can add your national interest and also the global one, the important things as humanity, not just one country and one community only. So they can keep a balance. Enlightened national interest can, can, can do that. So that's what uh, uh, we believe. 
and in fighting pandemic especially, not only global solidarity, the most important is national unity. Many countries who have done well with uh, COVID, they didn't politicize it nationally. Even the ruling party and the opposition parties formed a task force to work together to fight the pandemic. You don't need to politicize because it, the people will be affected by the pandemics are the same population that are going to vote this way or that way. So all parties have the obligation when a common threat comes. And WHO has been proposing from the start to follow, for countries to follow the national unity approach and have a task force of uh, all uh, political parties to, to mobilize their communities to fight the virus. And with strong national unity, then comes the uh, global solidarity, strong global solidarity uh, as well. Uh, so these are just a few uh, words I would like uh, to add. And thank you so much again to all uh, panel members, and especially to our um, uh, moderator, Latko. Uh, thank you for your leadership uh, and really good opportunity for, for, for WHO to learn and also at least uh, express our, our views as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone who is mad at me because we broke all, di all timelines. I'm the guilty one. For the ones who wanted to take a floor and who raised their hand and want to say something, I'm the guilty one because for both of those pressures, I suppose I decided to be the guilty one. We'll finish this and I'll be less guilty for the ones who will punish me for going over time and I will survive somehow the people who wanted to say something. But if you like this session, I want you to know that it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with these great panelists in here. So all the glory goes to people who shared the wisdom with us today, including Jeffrey, who is not with us, and Ban, who is uh, remote in a different way. So Jeffrey, I hope that uh, you are with us still and please best regards. I really. I'm interested to see you soon and best regards to Sonia because for once you don't know Sonia is the one of the best experts in health and she's also a medical doctor uh, Madame Sachs and I hope that she listened this and I'm sure that Jeff's wisdom on this part is very much connected to Sonia's readiness to listen to him and sometimes tell him something uh, one more thing uh, Jeffrey a few years ago reminded me that I should read Aristotle again. That's what he did as one of the two top global economists. And uh, then I saw one of the things that I was very much, I used, and Ismail knows that, well, I was using those is Aristotle's three types of knowledge, episteme, techne, and pronosis. Science, technical know-how, and let's call it wisdom, okay? And today we heard that there is a need to uh, let's say combine science, episteme and techne to a certain extent, combine it with promises, with wisdom, how to use these things. And Ismail again is the guilty one who then enlightened me later and said that's the first lesson you learn now, I'll tell you the second one. The second one is science can give you the most complex answers to the most complex problems. But science is not enough. Science cannot give you scientific answers to certain things which require wisdom. Just as an example, which he used to me, science produced the atomic bomb and atomic energy, but science is not the one who will scientifically say, should we make it, especially what to do with it. So that's not science. So we need the science and promises to be combined in this challenging time ahead of us, especially when it comes to the healthcare. Having said so, I think it is very important that uh, the big countries also can learn a lot of so-called small developing countries. I won't say in which country I was uh, with some of you when we were uh, testing, had tested, and that's uh, the economic and political and technological giant country. Guess which one? I was in one city, everything went smoothly. When I wanted to be tested, I went to another, uh, also developed part of that, world, that country, and I had so many problems to get tested, even in the midst of pandemic which means that and the reason was how they use technology and how they organize themselves. And that's what Timur was talking about, artificial intelligence and uh, 
early warning systems and tracking. There are some small countries, call it small countries, who made enormous progress in this fight against pandemic because they were well organized and they used technology in a proper way. I think it's one of the things that as we will Tedros discuss when we meet in, in Berlin, one of the major topics together with financing. And uh, to thank you once more, I'll close with uh, uh, continuing the sentence for words that Taimur started with, uh, Spaceship Earth. We are together on Spaceship Earth, and as Marshall McLuhan a long time ago said, we are now in Spaceship Earth, there are no passengers, we are all the crew. When it comes to healthcare, Marshall McLuhan was absolutely right, even having no clue in what mess we are going to end after he's gone. So thank you so much, and uh, calling for promises and Tehne and Episteme go together hand to hand. Thank you to everyone, thank you for your patience. <laughs>